of my salvation. Worship at your feet, O oh Lord. I love you, Lord, my beloved Jesus, my Savior and my King. I love you, Lord. Earth is filled with your glory. We 
stand in awe of your majesty. We have come to adore our King and join the angels as they say, Holy. Sing holy, come on, lift up your voice. Holy, holy, holy is the Lamb of God. Sing. Is the Lamb of God. Honor, praise, and glory. Honor, praise, and glory. Yes. Are As we gaze at your beauty, sing with me, come on. As we gaze at your beauty, cannot help falling on our knees. We cannot help falling on our knees. We have come to adore our King.
Blessed be your name, O oh Lord, we glorify you. We praise you forever. Don't tell me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed Lord, blessed Lord, blessed Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed Lord. You may be seated. Thank you. <clears throat> Is Brother Hennessy in the building, please? Would you stand, Brother Hennessy? Is he here yet? All right, Brother Dan Schaefer, if you will, please. Brother Dan, if you will, come up to the platform and greet us. Brother Dan Schaefer, a pastor of uh, Oklahoma City, is going to be our speaker on Friday morning. And he's had the river of the Lord break out in his church, mighty move of the Holy Spirit. And I want him to come for just a moment. Let's see, I need to get that microphone, please. I want him to come for just a moment and greet us. And um, Brother Hennessy, the president of the uh, Southeastern College of the Assemblies of God, is going to be our speaker tonight powerful man of God. I heard a message that he preached to the district council in New York some months ago. I guess it was last year now. And the message that he preached to, to the New York district council was tremendous, powerful. He's going to be our speaker tonight. I'd like to encourage you not to miss that for sure. But Brother Dan Schaefer has had a mighty move of the Holy Spirit break out in his church, and I want him to take just a moment and tell us about what's going on there. Would you welcome, please, Brother Dan Schaefer. God bless you. Sorry I didn't get to spend any time with you. Go ahead. God bless I have just one profound statement to make about what's going on in this church, and that is hallelujah. Praise God. The river is flowing and God's garden is growing. And the devil is in big time trouble. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. The first verse of Psalm 146 says, Praise ye the Lord. The last verse of Psalm 146 says, Praise ye the Lord. The first verse of Psalm 147 says, Praise ye the Lord. The last verse of Psalm 147 says, Praise ye the Lord. The first verse of Psalm 148 says, Praise ye the Lord. The last verse of Psalm 148 says, Praise ye the Lord. The first verse of Psalm 149 says, Praise ye the Lord. The last verse of Psalm 149 says, Praise ye the Lord. The first verse of Psalm 150 says, Praise ye the Lord. The last verse of Psalm 150 says, Praise ye the Lord. I believe it's time to praise God in this revival meeting. <laughs> Hallelujah. I've looked forward with great anticipation being with you 
and all of the wonderful ministers that have come from far and wide, it's revival time. It's falling all over the world, and what's happening here is a most unique outpouring and a forerunner of things to come. Oh, hallelujah. Because God has ordained this outpouring. It's not coming, it's here. But the good news is it's going to intensify. Can somebody shout hallelujah? hallelujah. Glory to God. The Lord has been just pouring out His Spirit upon us. Recently in nine services, we had 5,200 people saved wow. by actually signing cards. And I think in a few months we need to get uh, Brother John and Brother Steve to come to Oklahoma City and have a pastor's conference over there and uh, do something in our neck of the woods. <laughs> Amen. But these are wonderful, wonderful days, and I thank God for what He's doing. And this is by design. Some people speak of a sovereign move of God. It's not a sovereign move of God. The word sovereign means that God did it without any other involvement. But God has always wanted to pour out His Spirit. Can you say amen? Yes. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. And what's happened here is because somebody prayed and somebody fasted and somebody believed God and God answered prayer and you can see the result of what's happening here. We're not waiting on God. God is waiting on us. And I believe we've got a whole bunch of preachers, Pastor, that are sitting on ready, and all we have to do is throw it into gear, and we're going to peel rubber. We're going to have a time to serve God. How many are glad for the outpouring of the Holy Ghost that's falling all over this world right now? I'm glad to be with you, and I've just come to share the blessing and to get tanked up and drunk as I can get and, uh, and just have a great time and uh, get my own experience uh, a little deeper. And I'm just thrilled to be in the midst of you. And these are going to be wonderful, wonderful days. God bless all of you. It's wonderful to be Amen. in Pensacola. Thank you, brother. I love you, man. Today I want to uh, share this time with Brother Steve Hill. We changed the order of the service a little bit last night, as you can tell. Last night we was going to have the golden altar, but I wanted to go ahead and share that message last evening with you. Uh, my main message was going to be this morning, so since I preached last night, I'm going to share this morning with Brother Hill. Nobody can talk about an altar call like Steve Hill, and I want him to come in just a few moments. I'm not going to take much of his time. By 10.30, I'll give the pulpit to him. And we're going to break at 11.30 for lunch. And I wanted to say to you, too, before we get into the message this morning, I'm going to share some things with you about pastoring a revival that I want you to hear. I want you to be prepared for, because whenever revival breaks out at your church, you're going to be facing some of these things, and I want you to be prepared for it. You want to go ahead and get a pencil and piece of paper.
How many of you today are Pentecostal pastors? Can I see your hand, please? How many of you are here today and you're non-Pentecostal? Can I see your hands, please? God bless you. Now, let me tell you something before we get started good this morning. If I were you and I was coming to a conference like this and I had heard a lot about what's going on at Brownsville, I'd come in probably with my hackles up like some of you have come in here wondering, you know, is this of God? Is what's going on there at that church that I've heard so much about, is that really the Lord or is that a bunch of hype? What's going on? I'd come in looking myself to find out, is this of the Lord? But I want to just tell you, friend, you won't find a more skeptical man than standing behind this podium. I've always been a suspicious man. My wife has often said I'd make a great FBI agent. That's how suspicious I have been down through the years. I was the type of pastor that I really wouldn't let much go on in my church because I didn't want to have anything weird and crazy, although I was raised Pentecostal. But I just wanted to tell you, for what it's worth, what's going on in this church is a powerful move of the Holy Spirit. God has moved in. I have seen things I thought I'd never see. Mainly, 77, close to 80,000 souls, that's the number we're using. But actually, it's well over 100,000 people have been saved. We keep the numbers low on purpose. God has just moved in in such a powerful way. I've seen God touch people's lives, pastors that came in dry, thirsty, dejected, hurting, God has touched their life and turned them around, and they've gone home, and God's turned their whole church around. It's been one of the most powerful things I've ever witnessed. And God, beside that, touched me on Father's Day in such a way that I could never describe. He touched his church. He turned everything around. And whenever God moves in like that, in an awesome way in your church, it's going to change everything. And I just wanted to tell you that revival is coming to your church. It's just a matter of time. But I tell you, I believe that the pastors need to want revival before the Lord's going to show up. And this is something that you don't need to leave to a, a, a board member to come to this church and get blessed or go somewhere else to a revival and get blessed and hope that they'll bring it back to your church. This is something that God is going to bring through the federal headship of the local body. He's going to bring it to that local church. And... Uh, I'm going to change microphones. I can't hear. All right. I want to cover eight things real quick with you this morning concerning revival whenever it breaks out. I'm going to do these quickly. Whenever revival comes to your church and it's coming, it's just a matter of time. And I'm going to tell you something else is coming to all denominations. I think that all of God's people in all faiths and all walks of life have become so tired and so dry that we're desperate for a move of God. Baptist brethren, United Methodist, all of us that love the Lord and hold the Judeo-Christian ethics and principles of the Word, we're all dry and thirsty. And I've often said, friend, we've ridden this beast of religion as far as we could ride it, and it's dumped us off in a desert and left us to die. But God saw us in his mercy, and he sent a river in that desert. Thank God. And that river's picked us up now and has ushered us into something that we just could not imagine. It's like we're dreaming as God has brought us into such an awesome presence of his glory. But uh, there's, there's examples in the Bible. After every major move of God in the Bible, after every major move of God, there was always something that the Lord pointed out after that major move that he left us as an example to watch out for. And the first one was after God delivered Israel from Egypt, he brought them out with a mighty hand, and he brought them out under the blood. He brought them out with a major deliverance. He parted the Red Sea. He healed their bodies. He brought them out. Not one was sick. And after God brought them out and did great and mighty things in their life, what happened shortly thereafter was deception came in. And the Bible tells us that Aaron, while Moses was gone up on the mountain to hear from the Lord, 
deception came into the camp, and as deception came in, the high priest gave in to the people, and they brought him their gold and their silver, and he made the calf. And he said, this be your God that brought you out. Now, I don't understand personally. I want everybody to look at me and listen to me. I don't understand personally as a pastor how in the name of God, after God brought them out with such a mighty hand and did the great and mighty things that he did, how Israel could have such debauchery in their heart that after God brought them out of what they hated so bad and did such great and mighty things for them, I can't understand how they got deceived. When you are deceived, you believe right is wrong and wrong is right. That's what you believe. You believe black is white and white is black. While the man of God was up receiving instruction from the Lord, the high priest built that golden calf, constructed it, and they danced naked around it. And I want to tell you this, God knew when he brought them out from Egyptian bondage, he knew in his own divine wisdom and omniscience, God knew they would dance naked around that golden calf, but still in his grace and mercy, he brought them out. And I want to tell you, whenever revival comes to your church, revival really is the cure of all ills. It's a wonderful thing. It's the most glorious thing I've ever seen in my life. It'll turn your church around on a dime. It'll turn your ministry around on its heel. But I want to tell you something, friend, you're going to have to be careful of. Be careful not to worship the manifestations. You see, what's going on in Brownsville, what we like to say is there's been 100,000 people saved. And oh, by the way, there's been a few manifestations. It's not that people shake under the power of God and people fall out in the Spirit. And oh, by the way, there's been a few people saved. The emphasis is on salvation. And I'm going to tell you right now, falling on the floor won't save you and shaking under the power of God won't save you. I fell on the floor in this revival many times. Can't keep my head up. And I've shook under the power of God. Something I've never done. I've shook involuntarily under the power of God. Shake mightily. Woke up one morning at my house shaking under the power of God. But after I got through shaking, I was still John Kilpatrick. Only the blood will save you and only the blood can change you. And I tell you, there will be people when revival breaks out in your church, revival will draw all kinds of people to your congregation. It's going to draw hungry people, but it's also going to draw weird people. It's going to draw sensational seekers. It's going to draw people that's out after things that are wild and fanatical. And I tell you, whenever revival breaks out in your church, pastor, you're going to have to put a steady hand at the helm, not a controlling hand, because there may be some things that looks like it's man. It could be God. And some of the things that God does is so radical that we may think it's man, but just put a steady hand on the helm, not a controlling hand to manipulate and maneuver every little thing, but just steady it and watch that strangeness and weirdness and deception does not creep in because after God gave one of the greatest miracles in the Bible, it wasn't long until the devil wedged his way in with deception and Israel was almost smitten in the presence of God. Second thing I want to talk to you about is after God gave bread to Israel in the wilderness, 300 box cars every morning, fresh manna, every morning. The next thing that rose up, and this is one of the things you're going to have to watch for whenever revival breaks out in your church, is there's going to be men that will rise up and they will say, you take too much upon yourself, pastor. Matter of fact, turn with me to Numbers real quick. I want to just show you a verse of Scripture. Numbers chapter 16. Bible talks about in verse 1, I don't have time to read a lot, so go with me real quick, if you will. Numbers chapter 16, the Bible says, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Look at the last part of verse 1 of 16. Turn there real quick, if you will. Everybody, get, just turn your real, real quick in your Bibles. I want you to see this. Numbers 16. I want you to look at verse 1. Interesting reading here. Chapter 16, verse 1 of Numbers, it says, Now Korah, the son of Izhar, goes right on down. It says, Dathan and Abiram. Look at the last two words of verse 1 of chapter 16. It said, They took men. Look this way. 
when revival breaks out in your church, there's going to be rebellious men and women in your church that does not want what God's doing. And they're going to say that you're trying to get the church too holy, that you're requiring too much out of the body. You're trying to take the church too far, too fast. And the Bible said that they took men. And I also want you to notice what it says in verse 2. They rose up before Moses and certain children of Israel. And the Bible said they, they had famous, they had the famous in the congregation, and men of renown. They will try to go after the power people in your church. The rebellious people that doesn't want to move of God will try to nuzzle up to people in your church that's renowned people, men and women in your church, and they will try to get a foothold to cause up and stir rebellion against the move of God. And it says in verse 3 that they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and they said, you take too much upon seeing all the congregation. You're trying to make sure everybody's holy, every one of them, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, I won't go into all the details, but it said they took men and they came before the famous of the congregation. They tried to nuzzle in and gain a foothold. After God had given bread in the wilderness, mighty provision, day by day provision, and it began to rain down manna from heaven, rebellion rose up. Just because God begins to move in your church, friend, I want you to understand something. It doesn't mean that all your problems are over. Sure, the Lord's going to move in in glorious power, and sure, there's going to be great changes, but you're going to have to keep your eyes wide open and pastor that thing because the devil will try to get men to rise up in that congregation, and they'll try to get, gain and establish a foothold. And I don't have time to go into all the details, but you know what Moses said? He said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. He said, we're going to have a showdown. And he said, God's going to do something he's never done before. He said, I'll tell you what, all y'all come out of your tents, get all your stuff together, all your belongings, everything. Get all your families together. And he said, those of you that say we take too much upon ourselves and we're trying to demand too much holiness out of the congregations, he said, I'll tell you what you do. He said, you stand outside your tent. The Bible said that the earth swallowed them up. You remember that? The earth opened up and swallowed them up. You see, in the move of God, don't be afraid to put the Lord to the test. Don't allow somebody to stop the move of God in your church. We're not saying God open up the ground and swallow these people and kill them. No, that's not what we're saying at all. But I'm saying whenever God begins to move in your church, don't back up in fear and intimidation and give in to these people and let a move of God die out because you fear reprisal or rebellion. Put God to the test, and I guarantee you God will come through on your side every time, Pastor. Number three, next thing I want to point out is after the kingdom was established, one of the things you're going to have to watch for after David's kingdom was established, he moved from being a shepherd boy. The Bible tells us that God put him on the throne as the king. The women danced. You remember as they danced before the Lord, they prophesied. They said, you'll have your victories by the tens of thousands. Sure enough, he came to the throne. But you know, there's something about it that we can rest on our laurels if we're not careful. After God begins to move, we can sort of rest on our laurels and look around and say, my Lord, look what the Lord's done. And then we won't start delegating and let up on our praying and let up on what brought revival in the first place. And we want to start delegating it out to other people and letting other people be responsible for the move of God that the Lord has sent. And the Bible said, if you look at it very closely, it said that at a time when kings go forth to battle, David should have been going to battle. And the Bible said at a time when kings go forth to battle, that David went out. He stayed in Jerusalem, and he went out on the rooftop. And as he looked out, when all the men of the city were gone, and by the way, Bathsheba was bathing outside because all the men were supposed to be on the battlefield. Amen? All the men were supposed to be out doing war and doing what they were supposed to be doing as men. David sent Joab, and he sent others to do the job. That's why I say pastors don't need to send somebody to check out revival. They need to go themselves. And the Scripture says while kings at a time and a season, whenever kings go forth to battle, there was only certain times that they would fight because of the wind direction, because of seasons and different things. And at a time when they should have gone to battle, David stayed home 
And while he stayed home, his mind was idle, and he wasn't doing what he should have been doing. And the Bible said he looked down and saw Bathsheba. And I want you to look this way, everybody. Listen to this. Your mind is either going to plot strategy against the enemy, like David's mind as a king should have been out there on the battlefield, plotting strategy against the enemy, knowing how to ambush, knowing how to win the victory without casualties. His mind, instead of being out there on the battlefield, coming up with strategies against the enemy, that mind was still working, except this time he was coming up with a strategy on how to get another man's wife. It was still strategizing. He should have been on the battlefield, but he stayed home, but that mind was still plotting and still strategizing. And the Bible says that he even strategized as to how to have her husband sent to the front lines of battle and have him killed. So I want to tell you, after God brings you into what he's got for you, don't be surprised if sexual sins and sexual temptations do not come strongly to you. I'd like to stand here and report to you that after revival breaks out, everybody walks holy and pure before God. But I'm going to tell you, the devil comes and he tries to incite passion. And he tries to incite uh, attraction to the opposite sex more than ever. You've got to be wise, and you've got to keep your eyes wide open. Number four, the Bible says after the fire came down in Elijah's time, after his greatest victory killed the false prophets of Baal, we all know the story about Elijah. The Bible says that Jezebel sent him a word and said, tomorrow about this time, I want you to see if your life is not like theirs. No, number four is after the fire falls, Jezebel will come calling. The attack of the Jezebel spirit. I want to spend just a few minutes on this. If I could, please look this way. Let me give it to you real quickly. Bible says, look, first of all, folks, look this way. First of all, it says that the people came and brought a message to Elijah and said, you know, tomorrow about this time, because you've killed these 400 false prophets of Baal, tomorrow about this time, see if your life is not like one of theirs. Well, I want to ask you a question. After 24 hours passed and tomorrow about that time had passed, and he wasn't dead, why didn't he wake up? And why didn't he go after Jezebel? But after 24 hours, he didn't wake up. He came under some kind of a delusion and some kind of a, an attack by a Jezebel power and a Jezebel seductive spirit. And he didn't come out of, of it after 24 hours, and he kept going deeper and deeper. And the Bible said he went out in the wilderness. And I want to show you what God will do. God will go to extreme lengths to get you out of discouragement. Pastors, you can have a great move of God and the devil will smack you with a powerful discouragement. And I want you to be prepared for that. God will give you strength, but you're going to have to yield to the Spirit of God and not yield to that spirit of discouragement. You see, I believe every day in our life we yield to choices. We can either yield to the flesh and get discouraged and go deeper in that attack, or we can yield to God and let God bring us out of it. Amen? Well, look what happened. The Bible says that an angel woke Elijah up. Now, if I opened up my eyes and I saw an angel, I think I'd come out of my depression right off. He didn't do it. The Bible said that not only did the angel wake him up and he looked at him and talked to him, but the angel had something cooked for him. And he ate, went back to sleep, and the Bible said that the angel woke him up. That's when he ate the second time. Angel had water there and had some bread there. And then the Bible said he went 40 days in the strength of that man on that water. Now, first of all, let me back up. The attack didn't take place in 24 hours like Jezebel said. Number two, God sent an angel to talk to him. He saw him and heard him. Number three, the angel cooked for him and gave him a cruise of water. And then he went 40 days in the strength of that. Didn't get thirsty one time, didn't get hungry one time. I think after day 16, I'd have said, I'm coming out of this discouragement. I'm not even thirsty or hungry. I think after day 37, I'd come out of it and said, my God, I'm still not thirsty or hungry. But he kept going down, 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 deeper and deeper and deeper in that wilderness. Finally, he got all the way down there, and then the Bible says God talked to him. And the Bible says that the Lord gave him a display. He busted rocks for him and showed him his mighty power. Then the Bible said there was an earthquake came, shook him up real good. God's trying to shake him out of that. And then the Bible says, thirdly of all, he sent fire, tried to warm him up. And the next thing, he said he spoke to him in a still small voice. And every time God said to Elijah, Elijah, what you doing here? Every time he came back with this, well, Lord, you know, They've all forsaken you, Lord, and I'm the only one left. He never changed his story. And God did all these great things for, the, for, for Elijah, and nothing brought him out of it. And I want to end the story up with Elijah like this. After God did all that, sent an angel. After the attack didn't take place. After he went 40 days in the strength of that bread and water. 
after the rocks busted, earthquake came, the fire came, and after a still small voice, and God did all these great things, Elijah never changed his tune. And here's what God said to Elijah. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, on the way home, he said, anoint, hey, anoint to Elisha to take your place in your stead in your room. He said, you know, you're, you're saved and you're going to heaven. I'm going to send a fire chariot after you. That's exactly what happened. God sent a fire chariot after him four chapters, five chapters later. His ministry was over. He didn't die and go to hell, but his usefulness on the earth was completed. And he had to anoint Elisha to take his place. I think sometimes we can get so deep in discouragement and God does everything he can to get us out of it. We won't let the Lord encourage us. Well, friend, I'm going to tell you something. The Bible says for us to encourage ourselves. God's done so much for us that we don't need to count our curses. We need to count our blessings. Amen. Let me take you on real quickly. Number five, this is so important. The fifth thing that happened was after Nehemiah built the city, you remember there were two men there as he was building on the walls of the city, two men by the name of Sanballat and Tobiah. You remember those guys? They were the ones that taunted. They were the ones that mocked Nehemiah as he built the walls of the city. You might think that he'd got his eyes wide open and, and that all of Israel got their eyes wide open and these rascals would have been neutralized and had no power, no effect. But you know, if you turn to the book of, you don't have to turn there, I'll just give you the scripture. It's Nehemiah chapter 13 and verse 7 and verse 8. It says, I came to Jerusalem and understood of the evil that Elisha did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the house of the Lord. The priest prepared a chamber in the house of God for Tobiah. Prepared that rascal a chamber in the house of God. After a mighty move of God, after you get the walls built, after revival breaks out in your church, be careful that evil men don't creep in and get themselves established in that mighty move of God. That's why I look this way, everybody. That's why in this mighty move of God here at Brownsville, we keep everything culled. We have people that wear us purple prayer tag that prays for you because we want to make sure that everybody that does anything in this revival, we know their life. And I'm going to tell you something else. We don't allow people in this revival, and I'm criticized a lot for it. I'm willing to take the criticism. But number one, we want to make sure they have a good report. Number two, we want to make sure their life lines up and they're walking with God. Number three, we want to make sure, because I, I feel real strongly about this, that the Bible says lay hands suddenly on no man. I don't think I'd be the pastor God wants me to be if I let people come in this church and indiscriminately, without us really knowing a lot about them, them laying hands on you and praying for you. We don't know how they live at home. We don't know if their kids respect them. We don't know if their wife or their husband respects them. We don't know anything about them. We have to learn about them. And a lot of times pastors will sign letters that they can come and work on our prayer team, but a lot of times the pastors don't even know these people. And a lot of times we pick up reports on them, and whenever we do, we may put them on a probationary period and take them out for a while and love on them and counsel them and put them back, but sometimes we're not able to put them back because we want to make sure that whoever prays for you, that you're safe with them. You understand that? And I'm criticized a lot of times because we won't let people on the prayer team prophesy. Let me tell you why I won't. Because I know with you coming in here like you're coming in this church service today, I love prophecy if it's by people that live the life and they've got integrity and character and they're walking with God. But you know and I know that a lot of prophecies that come forth is not of God. You understand that? And I also want you to understand something else, that whenever somebody comes in here like yourself, for example, you, let's just say you, and somebody on the prayer team comes up to you and they so-called give you a prophecy and miss it a million miles, that killed the revival for you. That killed it. And I'm going to tell you something else we get criticism for. I won't let children pray in this revival. And i tell you why I won't let them pray. Number one, it's not that I don't trust the children. And number two, yes, I do love children. And yes, we do believe God's moving through some of their little lives. But I want to tell you something, friend. Whenever God begins to move and God begins to use people, you draw a satanic attack. And these children, as they begin to move out there in the gifts of the Spirit praying for you, it draws attack of the devil on their little lives. And sometimes their mom and dad might not come to church. And they might not be under covering at home. And although they might be under my covering here at the church, they still draw a terrible satanic attack. And it's not fair to put those children through that. I think it has to be highly supervised. And in this move of God, we just don't do that. And I know I take criticism for it, but I want you to understand something by me talking to you like I'm talking to you today. 
We're doing everything, friend, that we possibly can as a pastor and as an evangelist working together in tandem to make sure that, that nothing happens in this revival to grieve the Holy Spirit or to mess folks up when they come in here. Because you see, America's heard about this move of God. They've heard that God's moving, and they want to put their confidence in something that they hope is the Lord. And my responsibility is whenever they come in here, that nothing happens to dash those people and mess them up and say, oh, that's just what I thought. It's just a bunch of malarkey like all the other stuff has been. So we're doing our best, friends, to pastor this thing. So here's what I'm saying is watch after God gives great victory that evil men don't gain position. Number six, and I'm, I'm closing. Boy, this is very important here. The Bible says, you know, that Gideon healed Naaman. You remember that? God used him to heal Naaman. And he told him to go dip seven times, you remember? And after he came up, he was healed of his leprosy. You remember that? Well, the Scripture says that old Gehazi was standing nearby, you know, Elisha's servant. Here's the man that Elisha prayed and said, Lord, open up his eyes. And as he opened up his eyes, he saw the mountains and the hills full of fire chariots and horses. Here's a man that saw angels. Here's a man that looked in the supernatural. He knew the power of God. But yet, whenever Naaman was healed, Naaman offered Elisha a gift of money. He offered him a gift of value. And Elisha said, no, 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 no. Uh-uh, this is not about that. Gehazi was standing off, and after Naaman left, the Bible says Gehazi took off after him and said, I will take somewhat of him. I want to tell you something about revival. Revival is not about taking. Revival is not about money, friends. Yes, God will bless you in, in revival. God will open up the windows of heaven on your church. And yes, God will bless you in many, many ways. But I want you to look this way. When this revival first broke out, there was a businessman that got saved in the revival. And not too long after he got saved, see, when people get saved like that, they're so full of love, they want to do something. And a lot of times, people of means want to give and they want to bless. And we take up offerings here in the church and they can bless, you know, and that kind of thing. But a man walked up to my wife and put something in her hand. It was a check. A businessman that had just been saved mightily here in the church, and he walked up to her and he folded it up in her hand. He said, sweetheart, he said, I just want to tell you I love you and pastor. God bless you. And she took the check like that and put it right back in his hand. And she said, sir, I know you love us, and you don't need to do that to show your love for us. This is not about money. We want you to keep your money. We know you love us anyway. And I want you to understand, when revival comes, don't let the devil get you sidetracked with materialism and with money and getting your mind on money. Because some of the greatest temptations that a preacher ever fights, especially when God really begins to move, is the devil will fight him with the opposite sex and he will fight him with money. Be careful, pastors. I'm going to tell you, God's going to come in your church. He's going to move mightily, but you're going to have to be wise and keep your eyes wide open. Let me share something else with you real quick before I move on to point number seven. Listen, friends, I want you to go after God with all your heart and go after God with all your might. Jesus loves you. God's got a plan for your church and God's got a plan for your life and God wants to bless you more than you want him to bless you. And God's not going to bless you because you're perfect, but God's going to bless you because you're hungry. And he's going to bless you because you're going after him. But if he's blessing perfect people, he'd have never blessed me. But God's blessing you because he's made you hungry and you're going after God. And he'll never put you at the table and refuse to serve you. If you're hungry, it means he's, on, he's bringing you to his table. And let me tell you something else real quick. If God begins to bless you in your church and God begins to pour out his spirit, I know a lot of times after some of our greatest services, we face some of our greatest battles. I know coming up in the ministry, I didn't have anybody really to teach me when I first got in the ministry like that, and I had to learn by trial and error. And we'd have a great service on Sunday night. A lot of times, even before I got home, all hell was breaking loose. I'd wake up Monday morning, and the phone would be ringing. Somebody would be calling up, and there was trouble. And I got to where I almost dreaded a real powerful service because right after that, hell broke out. But I want to tell you something. I'd rather have all hell break out. I still want to move of God, and I still want the power of the Holy Ghost. Number seven. Number seven. After the miracles of Elisha, Gehazi covered the silver. He wanted to lust for more. Number eight, the last one, and this is the one I want to close with. Gedalia in Jeremiah chapter 40, verse 14. Gedalia 
was passive and Ishmael murdered him, Gedaliah was warned. They said in Jeremiah 40, 14, it says, Do you certainly know that Balas, the king of the Ammonites, has sent Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, to slay thee? But Gedaliah, the son of Ahakim, believed them not. I want to close with this. When revival breaks out, don't be passive and warn, and, and don't be passive and ignore counsel and wisdom. Humble yourself and be open for instruction. Listen to people. Don't be so headstrong that you know what's right, that what's right that you can't listen to people. Let God speak to you through people. When revival first broke out, God used a teenage girl the first week of revival. I had to humble myself like a little boy, and a God used a teenage girl to speak into my heart, and here's what she said, and I close with this. She said, Pastor, I've never done this before, but she was mightily touched in a service one morning about 3 o'clock in the morning here. She said, I've never been, I've never done this before. And she said, I just want to give you a word from the Lord, if I may. And I, I got down and I received it. And I got on my knees and I received it. And I said, tell me. She said, Holy Spirit said this is going to last a long, long time. And he also said to tell you that when revival breaks out here in your church, that before you have a need, God will already have the answer on the way for you. In other words, this is going to be so awesome and so mighty that before you will even know what to ask for real good, as you see the need really beginning to congeal and come together and form, God will already have the answer on the way to you. And I humble myself and receive that word from her. And during the course of this revival, I've done it a lot of other times. So number eight is don't be passive. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand together. I sense such hunger in this room. Could I say something before um, we sing all hail the power of Jesus' name? That last night when I was praying with some folks, some of you were just dying to receive and you're, you're just screaming out to God and, and one particular man. And, and I know exactly where you're coming from, friend, but you're going, Jesus, 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 just stomping and, and trying. Friend, what we have seen, what we have seen the pattern in this revival is that God is meeting us right where we're at. You can't twist his arm. You can't wrap his arm behind his back and jerk it and make him do anything. He is pouring out his spirit, friend. And by you being here, by you just being in the presence of God, you've shown the Lord, I'm serious, Lord. I want you to do something in my life. I'd like to encourage everyone to just uh, not, the, the term's not relax, but just rest assured that the Lord is in this. See, it's far greater than your church, Pastor. And it's those of you from Japan and China and Taiwan and from all over the world. It's far greater than your country, than, than your church. It has to do with your country. It has to do with the people of the world. God wants to save them. He wants to come to them, and he wants to use you. So it's not one of those things, that, and this is what we're saying, that you've got to come up here and just, just scream out to him and, and make him realize how serious you are. He knows. Is anybody listening? He knows. He knows you're hungry. Matthew, at Auburn, God's mightily, raise your hand this way, brother. God's mightily using, this is a street preacher. He preaches in the streets of Auburn. And uh, he he's, stands out on his car in, a bar, in front of a bar where people line up to get into this bar and preaches hellfire and brimstone and just preaching to the, the students, a brilliant young man. And he's, he's preaching to the students at the Union Green on campus and all over. God sees you, brother. I'm telling you, and I know you're having a lot of people saved and all, but it's not one of those things, Matt, where you gotta you got to get before God and, and make him do that. You're the, that's the heart of God. He's with you. I'm, so, I'm not saying don't pray, but as far as that, is, that, that part uh, of, of whether or not he's going to bless you, he's blessing you, brother. He's going to bless you because you're doing what he wants you to do. And he wants this country saved. I am convinced of that, friend. And if you're, if you're here today and you go, well, I don't believe this nation's going to be saved, get out of my face telling you, friend, I don't need you around, man. If you don't believe, is that? I love you dearly, friend, but if that's your attitude towards this nation, the sinners on the street have more faith than you do. If you don't think this nation can be turned around, you're going to be a, you're gonna be a, a stumbling block to revival. 
D.L. Moody said something. He said, if God be your partner, make your plans large. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I know, and I know if we could drag that man up on this platform tonight, D.L. Moody, he would, today he would say that very thing. He would say, they warned me about going to England. They said, I'd never be used of God there, and all heaven came down. They said, don't go to Scotland, and I went to Scotland, and all heaven came down. They said, you'd never be used of God. No one will come here you in the United States, and all heaven came down. If God be your partner, you make your plans large. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Sing this out. All hail the power. God bless you. You may be seated. For those of you that were taking notes during pastor's session there, I was taking notes, and he missed a point, and I, how many felt that? You go, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> so I want to know, you're li we're listening to you, brother. And um, that point was this. You can put this as point. One of them was when revival breaks out about the lust for money, okay, the desire for money. The next one would be this, that uh, it, this is, would be, you could put this as number seven. After Gideon's victory, man's ministry was worshipped. After Gideon's victory, and just put that, the danger of man's ministry being worshipped. I'm reading it straight from his notes, friends. I'm not making this up. <laughs> Judges 8.22. <laughs> so make sure, friend, when revival breaks out, that people don't come to you and look at you as some type of mighty man or mighty this or mighty that. We're all worms. We crawl in here every day, friend. 
That's just the way it is. Amen? Now, we all feel complete. Hallelujah. Page 50 in your syllabus. Also, there's some place for notes on 52. I've written most of the notes out already, so you don't have to be writing a lot. I'm going to go through this quickly, and we apologize for us staying this quickly, 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 but there's so much to be said in this revival. Please don't meet, uh, miss the sessions. And by the way, for those of you that are coming to a how-to uh, you know, conference, we don't know how to do anything here, friend. Everything that we've done right, we've stumbled on. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? We just stumbled on it. For example, the baptisms on Friday night. So many people were coming to us that were getting saved and saying things like this. Aren't we supposed to be baptized? Aren't we supposed to be baptized? And after a while, we're going, yeah, you're supposed to be baptized. So we started having baptisms. So people come here and they go, wow, that's awesome the way you guys planned that out. No, sir. God and the prayer team. You know why we got a prayer team? Because thousands of people started coming from all over the place, and you realize, Pastor, you can't pray for everybody. It's physically impossible. So the prayer team was formed. And the strict rules with the prayer team, that came about because we had some Looney Tunes that came. <laughs> and you want them out of here as quick as possible, friends, so you have rules. We have a board of people that, that, that if you're going to work on the prayer team, you've got to sit with them and answer questions. And pastors, I encourage you to do that. Make people confess up. Ask them questions like, how long have you been saved? Or, are you saved? You know? <laughs> Don't be. Basic stuff, friend. About tonight's service, um, Brother Hennessy's going to be preaching. And uh, let, let me explain something to you about the revival meeting services. This is Wednesday night. People are coming from all over America to tonight's service. And uh, they will continue to do so. They could care less if there's a pastor's conference coming in. They're, they're coming to receive from God. Sinners will come and stand in line for hours to receive Christ. The Dallas Morning News was here just a few weeks ago. And a lot of news reporters slip in and do reports without telling us about it. And the Dallas Morning News were here. And they went from person to person in that line to find out who's coming to the revival. And with tears in her eyes... She talked to me in the back, the news reporter. She said, I have never in my life, Steve, I talked to sinners, people that did not know God that had been in line for six hours. She said, I talked to some other folks that had been delivered of adultery, pornography, addictions that were in that line, and it just broke her heart. So, friend, people are going to come to this uh, revival tonight, and so we have a system to where we're, uh, we're uh, seating people in different areas. What we don't want tonight, friend, is for every, like for this sanctuary to be just full of ministerial staff and preachers. So, so we're going to work your, we're going we're gonna to divide you up among the builders. We have several overflows. How many can work with us on this? The power of God is everywhere, but come to tonight's meeting. But we want to make sure we have at least a thousand people in this building also, uh, and many of those that don't know the Lord. We, and so that's the way it is. So work with us. And um, it, it, we have a hard time just having a pastor's conference without, you know, and closing the doors to sinners for a week. Can't do it, Fred. I'd go, I'd go berserk. I appreciate this time to, um, to share with you about keeping an evangelistic focus in revival, bringing in the sheaves. Uh, number one, the work in the fields. Joseph Carroll said many years ago, according to the weight of the burden that grieves you is the cry to God that comes from you. According to the weight of the burden that grieves you is the cry to God that comes from you. You can write that down. That is a good quote. When did he live, Mike? A couple hundred years ago? 1600s, I believe. According, Joseph Carroll, according to the weight of the burden that grieves you is the cry to God that comes from you. Let me explain that, friend. According to the weight of the burden that grieves you is the cry to God that comes from you. You either have a burden or you don't. And if you have a burden for the lost, friend, a bur the burden of the Lord, then you're going to be grieved like the Lord is grieved. The Word says that as in the days of Noah, the Lord looked upon the face of the earth and all mankind was in wickedness deception. They were, they were running from God. They had left God in the dust. They were doing their own thing. And the Bible says it grieved the Lord that he had created man, that he had made man. 
It grieved him. It burdened him. He, he was overwhelmed with the fact that man had gone his own way. And if you have the burden of the Lord, friend, then you're going to feel that. You're going to feel. If you hurt for mankind, you are going to feel it. I remember uh, Mom Wilkerson, Dave Wilkerson's mom, when we were out in Texas, they were going to um, take us to New York City to do some street evangelism. And I told her, I said, listen, I love evangelizing, but I've, you know, I really don't have a burden for New York. And she looked at me, she said, you will. She said, when you get there, when we put you out on those streets, you're going to have a burden for New York City. And I remember when they started taking us out evangelizing and put us, put us right in the center of the cesspools. Sure enough, the burden of the Lord just came over me. How many know what I'm talking about? So you must, this is the burden, the, the work in the fields, friends, has first to do with the burden of the work. How many here feel an obligation to do something for Jesus? That is one of the proofs of the ministry. We're obligated to Jesus. What was the last thing Jesus said before he left out? Go into all the world. He did not turn to Peter and say this, Peter, look at my disciples. It is your responsibility, Peter, that every one of them are well respected. You've got a sword. I want you to make sure, Peter, that they're all respected and taken care of. Don't let anybody get over Matthew. Don't let anybody smooth over John. Don't let anybody get to my disciples. Peter, you're in charge of this group. Make sure they're well protected. Have a little militia watching over them. Make sure every one of my disciples have bodyguards. He did not say that. He did not turn to Matthew and say this, Matthew, listen to me and listen to me good. You've dealt with money before, so I'm putting you in charge of housing. You make sure every one of my disciples have a roof over their head, four walls, and a place they call home. He didn't say that, friend. And I could go on and on with the things that he did not say. What he did say was this, and this was the burden of the Lord. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. That, friend, was a dying man's last request. That would be like, Pastor, if you were dying and your congregation came one by one to visit you in the hospital and they knew you were dying of cancer, that you were dying and all hope was given up and you were lying on your bed, they would come by and, they would, and you would have something to say to them. I promise you, friend, what you say would count. What you say would count. The pastor, my pastor that's been with me for 18 years, and you're standing by his bedside, I want to tell you, friend, you would look up at that congregation member, you would say something profound. You would say something that's on your heart. You would say to some of the men of the church, act like men. Be strong. Be a soldier. Stand strong in the day of battle. You wouldn't look up at Bill or Judy or whoever it is and say, how you doing? Fine? Good. You have a great day, you understand? No, friend. And they wouldn't want to hear that. They wouldn't want to hear your last words. What do you have to say? You're leaving. Or perhaps you're going off to the field and never coming back again. Go on off to the mission field. Your family, your friends would want to hear what you have to say. This is what Jesus chose to say. This is the burden of the Lord. Is anybody with me today? Our obligation. It's our obligation to Jesus, friend. I feel obligated to Jesus Christ to fulfill the Great Commission. I don't feel a choice in the matter at all. He saved me. He has delivered me. I am obligated to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's so many scriptures that point to what we should be doing, friend, on the face of this earth. And then our obligation to others. I'm talking about your revival meetings, friend. What's making you tick? What do you want revival for? What is the whole purpose behind having a revival in your church, having God come down and people get saved like Brother Schaefer just shared? He's had 5,000 people come to the Lord. What is, your, what is your purpose behind it all? How do you feel about others when they walk in? Are they numbers or are they human beings? I liken this, friend. My obligation to others, I liken it to a, a cruise ship. I want you to imagine with me that we're all on a cruise ship. Christians and heathen alike, we're all on the ship. Millions and millions of people on this mega ocean liner, and we're all cruising across the Atlantic. And, and we work, a couple of us work our way down to the bottom of the ship. And it's got many, many layers on that ship. We work our way all the way down to the bottom. And as we're down at the bottom of the ship, we notice something that changes everything. It changes the food schedule. It changes the sleep schedule. It changes the recreation schedule. It changes everything. We discover a leak. We discover that the boat has hit an iceberg and there's water gushing in the bottom of the boat. 
and it's starting to rise up around our ankles and rising up to our, our, our knees. And as quickly as we can, we, we scurry up the stairway. We, we spin around as fast as we can, warning everyone the boat is going down. Now, there's always going to be people, friend, that don't believe you. There's going to be people that mock. There's going to be people that keep on dancing. There's going to be people that say, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. They'll keep on drinking. But there's going to be a lot of people that believe you. Whether or not they believe me, my responsibility is I am obligated to others to let them know the boat's going down. The boat is going down. It may be tomorrow. It might be 10 years from now. But this ship called Earth is going under. It's all going under, friend. It's all going to burn. It's all going to be annihilated. Something's going to happen, whether it's tomorrow or 15, 20 years from now. Something's going to happen. You are obligated to others. I liken it also to some of us that have been delivered from a fire. You've been pulled out of this fire. A house was burning, and someone rescued you. And, and you're laying out on the front lawn, and you're laying out there, and you're, you're so appreciative that you've been saved. And then you hear the cry of someone else inside the house. Are you willing also to stand up and go back into the fire to rescue somebody else? You are obligated to rescue that person, friend. It is your obligation under Christ's name to rescue these people. I'm talking about the work in the fields, the burden of the work. Well, the urgency of the work. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. I preached that one night in this revival. The night cometh. There is coming a time, friend, where you're not going to have the opportunity to work. There is coming a time where you're not going to have the opportunity to have a revival service. There is coming a time, friend, when it will all be over. Today is a day. Now is a time. It scares me when pastors talk to me about down the road. Down the road, maybe in 97, maybe in 98 when we're ready. Who do you think you are to talk like that, friend? We have no guarantee of tomorrow. James says, who are you to say tomorrow you're going to go to such and such a city and buy and sell and get gain? Who do you think you are? Tomorrow is a word only found in a fool's calendar. You ain't got tomorrow. All you have is now, and that is the, it, the urgency of the work. Say not, John 4, 35, say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest. There was an eminent philosopher, his name was John Dewey. He found his son one day in the bathroom. The floor was flooded, and this philosopher was a great thinker. So he stood there over his son and began pondering this predicament, trying to understand the situation with water all over the floor and getting deeper. After a few minutes, the son said, Dad, this is not the time to philosophize. This is a time to mop. <laughs> and I want to tell you, friend, in the condition this country's in, this is not the time to, to gaze across the land and go, dear God, look at the abortion rate. Dear God, look at the adultery rate. Dear God, look at this, look at that, look at the crime, look at the drugs. This is a time to go to work. This is a time. Do you feel the urgency, friend? I hope so. Every night in these meetings, there's been times in this place, friend, where people would think I was mad. I mean, I was just, we, we would scream at them and just plead for them. And we've had sinners scream out and fall from the pews as dead to where their sinner friends have carried them and dumped them at the altar or someone who knew they were, they would scream out. We preached messages that were so intense on this is it. You don't have one second more. As a matter of fact, during some of the meetings, I will, I will count off the last 60 seconds of the altar call. And I am amazed, friend, that people that fought for 20 minutes through the altar call, the last 60 seconds, their heart starts doing this. And they realize the urgency of it. And we've had hundreds and hundreds of people saved in that last 60 seconds. The urgency of it. Another time, we played taps during the altar call. There's a lot of military in this city, friend. We played taps, and people began moaning and groaning, but there was still something going on that God was still plugging on people, a lot of, still, still working on people, and a lot of folks came forward, and the Lord said to me, play Reveille. Play Reveille. And there was, a, there was a military man sitting right back there in that back row, and he made it through the altar call. He made it through taps. 
but he was dead meat when Reveille played. <laughs> he was in spiritual slumber. You remember that night, Pastor? He was in spiritual slumber, friend. He, his, his spiritual life was just so laxed, and he had he backslid, he was away from God, but when Reveille was played, man, like a soldier, he came down here. I'm telling you, there ain't no time. Today is the day. Now is the time. Hallelujah. Hmm. The urgency of the work. I'm moving quickly through this, I guess. <laughs> Let me talk to you for just a minute about the intensity of this work. The intensity, the violence of revival. The violence of the revival. Cleaning the fields and sowing the seeds. I remember talking to Carlos Anacondia in Argentina. I would ask him, I said, talk to me about revival. And he told me, he said, Steve, you can, you can take the conferences, you can take them or leave them. I do them all over the world, he says, but I want to tell you what I like more than anything else. I like busting rocks and getting dirty. And those were his evangelistic meetings, busting rocks and getting dirty. And by busting rocks, he means out there, friend, cleaning the fields, cleaning the fields. In evangelistic preaching, listen to me, pastors, and I'm not an authority as an evangelist. I just, God has given us favor on some things. But what I have noticed is when people come into this revival, they come in with all kinds of problems. They come in and, and there will be nights we'll have five or 6,000 people on campus. They're everywhere. They're in the hallways sitting in a seat listening underneath a speaker. They're, all, they're in the bathrooms listening through a speaker. They're all over this place. And they come with complex problems. Witches come in from the, the West. They come in from New Orleans. Warlocks will come in. Multi-millionaires. We we've had federal judges. We've had uh, governor's families come here, friend. They come from all walks of life. And you think you know people, but you don't, friend. And we'll begin speaking to them. And it, it, it's it, it, to do with cleaning the fields. Everyone's heart is like a field. It's like, it's like a field ready to be plowed. But some folks come in here, friend, and they got boulders in their lives, boulders of doubt, boulders, maybe some where they were rejected as a child. We have had hundreds of testimonies in this revival of when people are being baptized. They'll, they'll, they'll testify to us how they were raped as a child. There, there, there was incest in the family, and we've had this confessed so many times from that baptismal pool. And that is like a boulder in their lives, keeping them from God. And I remember that all through the evangelistic message, friend, that there's people out there that don't have a clue of what I'm talking about. And I've got to remove that from your life so you can say things like this. Regardless of what has happened in your life, whether you were raped as a child, and when you say that in a meeting like this of this size, you'll see heads drop all over. They just drop, and they'll just, like they're nervous, like you're going to call them out. And you say, regardless of what you've been through, Jesus will heal you, regardless of the pain and the suffering. How long are you going to carry that, sister? How long are you going to carry that, sir? God loves you and has a plan for your life, and tonight he will heal you. That is cleaning the fields, friend. Before the altar call, that's clean. that boulder was just removed from that child's life, that boulder of doubt and, and, and resistance. And I've said sometimes, uh, you remember the scripture where it says, uh, Paul, I believe, was, who did hinder you? Who did hinder you? To the Galatians, I believe it was. Who hindered you? And I talked one night about preachers. And I said, was it a preacher that hindered you and caused you to stumble? Was it a preacher? I talked about the preachers. I talked about yourself. I talked about Satan. But I covered the preachers well. I said, was it a preacher that you confided in? You were the secretary of a church. And one day he came up and put his arm on you and caressed you. And he said, let's go out to lunch. And you did, and next thing you know, you're having an affair with that preacher, and everything just blows up in your face. The whole thing goes, the whole church goes crumbling down. Your life goes crumbling down. Was it a preacher that caused you to stumble? You were only six months old in the Lord, and hundreds of people came forward that night, friend. I guarantee you, scores of those had been hurt by preachers. But what you're doing is removing those boulders. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You're cleaning the fields. There's so much more there, and you're sowing the seeds. Sowing the seeds, friend, when we preach every night, I make sure that I plant one crop and one crop alone. Okay? One of the, one of, one of the reasons this revival has, has, has grown the way it's grown is because people come in and they hear the same thing every night. It's a pie 
that has to do with the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, the blood and the cross, but it's cut a thousand different ways. But every night, sinners know that get saved tonight, that tomorrow night they can bring an unsaved friend and someone's not going to stand up behind this pulpit and throw out some pear seeds or some apple seeds when last night the preacher threw out okra. They want to bring their friends to a, a service where their friends can be saved. They want to bring their friends to a service that, where their friends are going to hear the same thing they heard the night before. They want to know about the blood, the cross, the grace, the mercy of God, the wrath of God. They want to hear the same thing. So when you're sowing those seeds, friend, make sure you're not throwing some hodgepodge of seeds out there to where people get so mixed up and they say, well, what's a revival about? They go, I don't know. I don't know. You know, what's the preaching about? Well, you know, they, one night they spoke about family. The other night they spoke about how to be successful in your business. And the other night, you know what I'm talking about, friend? Keep an evangelistic focus. Sow the seeds. Bust the rocks. Get them out of the, the, get them out of the field. And then throw the same seeds out there night after night. Pastors, let me tell you something else. If you hold a revival or you have an evangelist, if you get an evangelist come in and he wants to thrill people with his oratory skills, and he's up there to teach, you know, and, and he comes to you and says, well, I just got a feeling, I, get, I just got to do this and do that. Friend, that's pride. See, I'm not the federal headship of, of Brownsville Assembly. This man is. He's the pastor of this church. He's the teacher. He's the shepherd. He's over the flock. I am here as a visiting evangelist. My job is to keep the gospel simple. My job is where an eight-year-old can understand it. I know if an eight-year-old can understand it, an 80-year-old can understand it. So keep that evangelistic focus, friend. Say, well, you know, you're just the same kind of altar calls every night. Friend, absolutely. And if Christians get sick of it, they don't need to be there anyhow. But what you're going to do, what you're going to do, I'm telling you, they won't get sick of it. Christians won't get sick of it because they're going to watch the people get saved night after night after night after night. Oh! And they're going to feel, they're going to feel his presence. They're going to know Paul came with a demonstration of power. So preach, friend. Keep that focus in a, van, in, in a revival. What's the purpose of your revival? And I heard, and I'm not criticizing any revivals or any moves that have gone on around the nation or the world. But there's some that, were, that are so laxed when it comes to the Word of God. You can count on one hand the times I've not preached in this revival since Father's Day of 95. John Kilpatrick preaches every, every Sunday. We preach. We share the Word, friend. Why? What's going to change your life? What's going to pierce your heart? A testimony? Yeah, it's great, friend. But what about the Word? What about the Word of God? You've got to preach the Word, friend. They've got to hear. How are they going to hear unless you preach it? Where are we at? Spiritual irrigation. This has to do with tears, and I'm going to go through this one quick. I'm a weeper. I'm not saying that you have to be a weeper, but you can preach with a weeping heart. People can tell when you care about them. And young people come here by the thousands. And I can walk up to a group of young people visiting from North Alabama or Georgia or Sweden. We had a group of 40 people from Sweden here one night. And it's a, young, it's a group of teenagers from Sweden. And I, at the beginning, when, I, when they first came, I greeted them, I loved on them, but they needed the gospel just like everybody else. And when I preached to them, I preached with love, with tears in my eyes, with a compassion, but I refused to stand before judgment day, stand before God one day, and the Lord look at me and say this, I brought you 40 young people from Sweden that needed me. They needed a touch from me. But because they were international visitors, but because you thought they looked saved, they acted saved, just because you, every, you, someone had told you that they're all Methodists or all Lutherans, you didn't confront them. You confronted everybody else, but not them, friend. I don't want to be held accountable for that, friend, on Judgment Day. But compassion, you can write the word compassion down there next to this irrigation, spiritual irrigation. And that has to do with suffering together. That's what that word compassion means. It means to suffer together. When they see your tears, friend, they see your brokenness, they know you care about them. They know you care about them, friend. 
You love them. And I have sinners literally. This is literal, friend. They call me at my office, sinners. They call me at my home. And they say things like, don't give up on me, preacher. And I go, Bill, you know I love you, man. I know you do, preacher. And I'll say to him on the phone, I'm going to nail you one day. He said, I'm coming, man. He said, matter of fact, the guy said this last week to me. He said, I'm coming, brother. Let me have it. I said, you know I will. I'll point right in your face, brother. God loves you. has a plan for your life, but he ain't putting up with your junk. You think he's putting up with it. He ain't putting up. Over the phone, we'll do that. Why would a sinner call the evangelist? I'm talking about a notorious sinner in town, a drug dealer. Why would he call me? Because he knows I care about him. He knows I care about him. He knows he's going to hear the truth. So that's suffering together. I suffer with Bill. I know what he's going through. I know the pain. That's compassion. This last point, the working man's harvest, given the altar call. Let me spend just a minute on this, friend. The altar call, I believe, is going to take a prominent position in this great end time awakening in America and all over the world. See, an altar call, friend, we've all seen them on television. We've had them in our churches, and I've traveled this nation and the world. I've seen all kinds of altar calls, and I've given all kinds. But what I'm noticing in this nation, and this nation is ready to get saved. This nation is get, they're, they're ready to get saved. But if you stand before them, you'll see in the meetings tonight, tomorrow night, the next night, next night, on Sunday, when we give an altar call, friend, we leave no stone unturned. No stone. I believe in taking the net and throwing it out and pulling it in. Dump the fish on the altar, let Jesus sort them out, and I'll throw the net out again. Pull it in again. Dump the fish at the altar, let Jesus sort them all out, throw the net out again. Pull them in again. Dump the fish in, throw the net out again, friends. Sometimes four and five times in a service, and you would be amazed. Sometimes the last throw, the last throw, a multimillionaire gets saved. The last throw after fighting 20 minutes of the altar call. A drug dealer in the balcony will come give his life to Christ. It's amazing, friend. I've never seen anything like it. What caused that? Was it 20 minutes of watching these people wail at the altar? Was it 20 minutes of them thinking in their heart, I wish I could do that. I, if he would just do it one more time, I'll go. But what do we do? Bow your heads, close your eyes. This is what we do, friend. I'm not against this. We just don't do it here. Bow your heads, close your eyes. If you want Jesus in your heart, slip up your pinky. <laughs> if you want Jesus as your Savior and Lord, slip up your index finger. I see that finger. <laughs> Think about it, friend. That's what we do. All eyes closed, no one's looking around. Think about those statements. Jesus hung on the cross nude. Most theologians will agree with me on that. He hung on the cross, naked for us, on top of Mount Calvary, not behind Mount Calvary, on top of Mount Calvary, naked. He was crucified, he bled, he shed his blood, he was beaten, he was whipped. It was all public. And we're saying, if you want Christ, close your eyes, bow your heads, and slip up your finger. Slip up your hand. God bless you, you can put your hand back down. God bless you, put your hand back down. I see you, sir, put your hand back down. What is that? What is that? And I'm just encouraging the pastors, I'm not against anything. Please don't get me wrong. Don't misquote me. By the way, everything that's said in this revival is on tape. <laughs> everything from Father's Day to today is all filmed. It would take you five or six months to watch this revival nonstop, 24 hours a day. So if you misquote me and someone calls and said, did you say this? I'll say, get the tape. <laughs> I'm not against any other altar calls. What I'm saying is America is ready for public confession. They're ready to get saved. So what we do in this revival, all eyes open, everyone looking at the preacher, and here we go. If you're away from God, if you're a backslider in this place, you're one of, one of the most miserable people on the face of this earth. You have one hand in the hand of the devil and one hand in the hand of God. You're serving God and mammon, but the Bible says you cannot serve God and mammon. You'll either love the one and hate the other or hate the one and love the other. You cannot serve two masters. Which one are you, backslider?
and hit the backslider. We'll hit the religious people. I'm talking about throwing the net. Those of you in this room will say that a religious raised in church, you've hung around the cross all your life, but you're not on the cross. You've hung around it. That's religion is hanging around the cross. Christianity's getting on the cross. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So if you're hanging around the cross, you're wearing the cloaks of religion, you look good in the choir robe, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. You've never known the Lord. Religious person, I don't care if you've been around for 42 years, you can go to hell with baptismal waters on your face. You can go to hell with a certificate from the assemblies of God hanging on your desk wall. What happens, friend? Some of the people that are going, boy, I hope he gets sinners. You know, they're looking around for a junkie or a prostitute. And then you go, they go. <gasps> Friend, I'm talking about the altar call. For those of you that say, anyone who's never been saved, I want you to come forward. What is that, friend? You know what you're doing when you do that? Listen to me well. When you say that, there could be a 60-year-old man out there that got saved when he was six. In a children's church, he doesn't remember it, but his grandma said he did. And said he's going to be saved. He's saved. He's saved. So you, so you automatically nixed him. He's, un, he's as ungodly, living with pornography, living in adultery, but you didn't hit him. He's saved. Someone told him he's saved all through his life. He's going to be saved no matter what he does. That's what he was taught when he was a child. And so what you've done with that altar call, friend, is you've let him run scot-free. So open up the altars to everyone and then let your prayer workers sort it out. And by the way, we don't count all the people that come forward. You're going to see hundreds and hundreds. Sometimes they're all the way down to the aisles. In the chapel, they'll be all the way down the aisles. In the cafeteria, we'll have two or 300 people saved there. And it's just large altar calls. I know good and well not every one of those people are getting saved for the first time. There's a lot of backsliders. There's a lot of sin. But let the Lord sort that out. And we don't count all those numbers. The numbers you're going to hear are, are less than half of that. But open up the altars, friend, because what you're going to have is you're going to have some, some brother from, that's visiting from outside town. He's going to come forward in that altar call. And sure, there's going to be a prostitute getting saved. There'll be some junkie getting saved. There'll be some kids, some rockers getting saved. But here's this man who's been in church all his life, but th there's a claw on him of pornography. And it's a secret thing that he does in, the, in the, the secret of his own home. And if you went to his house and, and looked under the rug, and his, he's got a rug in the closet, and underneath that closet rug is a subscription to Playboy and Penthouse. And no one knows about it but him. It arrives undercover. A lot of those porno houses, you know, they send their stuff in just regular cardboard boxes with no names on them, just the name of the occupant, the person that's receiving it. Why? Because people are embarrassed of it, friend. And they, they run with those triple X rated videos and they go hide them. And they take them and they, they watch them when mom is asleep, when the kids are asleep. They watch it. It's going on all the time, friend, all over America. Don't fool yourself. There are people in our churches that leave out on Sunday. They'll go home and watch filth on the television like nobody's business. But we call them saved. They ain't saved, friend. Get real. That's not salvation. That's not salvation. And so make sure when you give the altar call, friend, you open up the altars for people to come forward. And we have them get down. We have the whole place stand, and we tell them as soon as charity begins to sing, come as quickly as you can. Come as quickly as you can. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait. And one of the reasons that so many people are staying saved is, as Mike Brown says, is because they're getting saved right. They're getting saved right. They're repenting. Sin has been nailed. Hallelujah. Can you feel the intensity of it? Let me say, Ian McPherson said this. Let me say outright that no man who is not prepared to work himself to death has any right in the ministry at all. Charles Spurgeon says this, kill yourselves with work, then pray yourselves alive again. <laughs> this has to do with the intensity of the work, friend. It's hard work. Isn't it hard work, Bob Strano? Is it hard work? It's hard work, man. The work of the ministry is tough. It's hard. This is no picnic, friend. I'm beat. I've been beat since Father's Day. I'm 95. We live wasted. We live totally wasted. It is hard work. And then on top of that, once a million four hundred thousand people have come to the church, you can't go anywhere. You want to go out to eat? Forget it. 
everywhere you go, hey, I know you. Pray for me. <laughs> Fred, is it like that, Pastor? Everywhere you go, man. I remember walking to the mall, and I was going to go buy a suit. You know, we wear out all our suits. I was going to go buy a suit. And I walked in, and a, a lady screamed out, okay? She goes, don't touch me. <laughs> and I said, ho. Oh. Just want to see your suits. <laughs> but there ain't no rest, friend. You, pastors, you laugh, but you're going to see it happen, friend. Once the power starts coming down, and you go to Walmart, you'll go anywhere, friend. We can't go within 200 miles of this place. You can't go to a Circle K. I mean, you'll be get, you think you made it scot-free through the Circle K. You know, you paid for your gas, you're walking out the door, and you'll hear, excuse me, sir, 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 sir. Listen, uh, come here for a minute. Here they go, boy. Listen, I got a son who's on drugs, and I've been watching y'all on television. I know what's going on over there. And, and if I brought my son over to your house, would you minister to him for 18 hours, you know? We had someone invite us on a cruise on their, their yacht, and we, we haven't been able to do any of that since we've been here because it's just too busy. And, uh, man, they just dressed up this thing. Just, it was just going to be awesome, just you and your family, okay? And our family, they said. And, oh, yeah, I've got this son. <laughs> and they said, he's been on drugs 18 years, and he'll be there too. Listen, you don't have to talk to him, but if you get a chance, <laughs> I'll go ahead. So, friend, that has to do with the work of the Lord. We're in this for the long run, friend. The worker's reward, and I'm going to close in just a few seconds. Hallelujah. The worker's reward. Our attitude towards ourselves. But to this man will I look, even him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and that trembleth at my word. The New American Standard says, humble, he who is humble and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. Look at me, friend. When it comes to working in a revival and the attention you get, the bottom line is, I've said it at the beginning of this time, we're all worms. We're all scum. We are. There's, it's the grace of God that you're alive and preaching the word, that God's coming to your church, Pastor. It's his grace. It's his grace. And when I see puffed up people, when people come into this revival, and we've had them, we've had you name the folks, friend. We've had big-time folks come through here. When, when people come up to me, and the first thing they say to me is how, who they are, how great their ministry is, what they're doing around the world, I feel like a stench just rose up to heaven. Just a stench. I go, that's not what this revival's about, buddy. No, you're not going to get on the platform and talk to everybody how great your church is. You're going to sit out there with the people. I had a, member, a man with a 7,000-member church came into this place, sat in a T-shirt and jeans, came forward at the altar call to be prayed for. I mean, he was so humble. I would go to his church in a heartbeat. He didn't care if anybody knew he was here. He just wanted God. What's the attitude towards yourself, friend? The Bible says, to this one I will look, the one who is humble, broken in spirit, and who trembles at my word. Pastors, that's a good message, by the way. Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. So that's your attitude toward yourself. A little bit more about the work, willing workers versus lazy laborers. D.L. Moody, look at this second quote. After a man is a Christian, I work him day and night. I believe that for one man killed by overwork in the cause of Christ, 10,000 die from laziness. <laughs> Be willing, friend. And I know we parked on this quite a bit. But be willing to work. Get ready to get out of bed. You know, these revival services are likened to, to the fields and all around this county, this area right now. I've seen combines 11 at 12 o'clock at night going through the fields with their lights on. That's what a true revival is all about. You're willing to skip the evening meals and go get the combine and get out, put the headlights on and get the harvest in while there is time, friend. Let me close with the worker's reward. I apologize for going too quickly through this, but tough. <laughs> the 
The workers were warned. The greatest reward in this revival, friend, in any of our revivals, Leonard Ravenhill used to say this to me all the time. He said, Steve, the true test of your ministry is 10 years later. See, this revival can make all kinds of noise. I want to know what Brownsville Assembly is doing in, 19, in the year 2005. I want you to be able to come to this church and see a thriving church. I don't want you to come to this church and see some shell of a building and a group of people meeting in the foyer or in some, you know, some little side shoot building and the rest of it just be a, a ghost town. And you go, that's where God moved. No, friend. The true test of a revival is 10 years later. The true test of an evangelist is 10 years later. It's not all the noise we make right now, friend. It's what's there down the road, fruit that remains. That's why we love this revival, because we're watching people get saved, go on with God. And you're going to hear it this week. You're going to hear testimonies. People going on with God. A year later, they're on fire. Their whole family's been saved. They're going into the ministry. Great, no greater joy, friend, John said, than this, to see that my children walk in truth. That is a great reward of the revival, but I'm going to share one more with you. How many believe one day that there's going to be a, we're going to all experience a coronation day? How many believe there's going to be a day of rewards? And I don't believe anyone in this place is, 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 has even given thought, and I don't give any thought to it, of, of some type of blessing that I'm going to get up in heaven. This is a blessing, friend, being saved. Seeing Jesus is going to be all I want in heaven. But I want to explain something to you. William Gurnall said, value yourselves by your inheritance in the other world, not by your honor and riches in this. On Leonard Ravenhill's epitaph, on his gravestone are written these words, are the things you are living for worth Christ dying for? Those of you that knew Leonard Ravenhill, Mike and I got a chance to be with him for several years before he died, and he just nurtured us and trained us and poured his life into us. And you know, when he died, I thought for... Sure, on his gravestone would be something like, he's fought a good fight, you know, rest in peace. 87 years of age, fought like a soldier. Those of you that are familiar with him, he wrote, Why Revival Terry's, Meet for Men, Revival God's Way, Revival Praying, just a man of God, good friends of A.W. Tozer, New Smith Wigglesworth, a great man of God. On his tombstone, I went, we went to his funeral, went through all that, and then it took several weeks for them to get the tombstone in place. And then finally arrived, I went over there to see what it said. And I thought for sure it was going to say, I have fought a good fight, you know. Went up to it, and Leonard was dead and gone, but his bony finger was still sticking. <laughs> you know, Keith Green's buried right next to him, and it says, gone to be with Jesus. It's beautiful. You know, his, his kids are buried in his arms uh, in the plane wreck. You know about that, the plane crash. Keith is buried right next to him, and it says, gone to be with Jesus. It's beautiful. But Leonard, no. Are the things you're living for... <laughs> Worth Christ dying for. I looked at him, I went, dear God, Len, let me just be here, would you? <laughs> let me just pay my last respects. <laughs> no way. Being dead, he still speaks. But friend, this is it. One day, we're going to stand before God. And I want to explain this to you, and we're going to give you a break now. We're going to all stand before the Lord. I don't know what it's going to be like. I think John got a glimpse of it. But one day we're going to all stand before the Lord. And what happens up there depends on what I did down here. Did you hear me? You want to read the books on the letters and the, 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 the scriptures on judgment? Friend, do a word study. Something's going to happen up there. Everyone's going to be judged. Everyone, there's going to be the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. Everyone will be judged for what they did down here on this earth. You, brother, you, sister, will be judged. It's not going to be entered thou into the joy of the Lord. No, there's going to be a stopping place where God is going to judge everything that we did. He's going to judge how we spent 80 years in this tabernacle. And I am convinced, friend, that on that day, I'm going to do something for myself. On that final day, when the Lord calls my name, when he calls out my name, what I don't want to receive is this. I want you to bring this up, friend. This is a cardboard crown. It's made of paper, and it's got little S's and stars on it. S stands for satisfactory. Satisfactory. 
you did okay. You barely got by. On that final day, friend, I'm talking about the harvest that we're about to experience in America, the hard work you're going to be involved in. I want to be able to sit with Paul, John Wesley, the rest of them at the marriage supper of the Lamb and look at them straight in the face. I want to be able to look at the martyrs. I want to be able to look at the people that went before us. I want to be able to look at the apostle Peter in the eyes and want him to look at me and go, we were watching you, buddy. You went after it. You went after the gold. You went for the very best. I don't want to sit around that table. I don't want to sit at the marriage supper of the Lamb and have these great men and women of God that have gone on before me look at me and go, how you doing, man? You know? <laughs> Nothing to talk about. Why? We didn't do piddly. On that day, I don't want the Lord to come up to me and I don't want the angels to pass some crown around and as it gets towards me, the Lord placed some satisfactory crown on my head because this is the reason, friend, I don't want that to happen because the crown is all you're going to have on that final day to throw back at his feet. The only thing you're going to have to give back to Jesus is what he places on your head, friend. Casting down our golden crowns, friend. What do you think it's going to be like on that day, friend? You're going to be held accountable for what you did on this earth. Now, I know, friend, this is hypothetical. I'm just painting a picture. Theologians, back off. <laughs> and if you got any problem with this, talk to Mike Brown. He's writing a commentary on Jeremiah and Lamentations for Zondervan. He's brilliant. So if you got a problem with my preaching, talk to him. He answers all the questions. But on that day, friend, on that day, I don't want the Lord to look at me and go, just another one of those, just another one of those pastors, just another one of those evangelists that, that just, just did piddly in America. I anointed him, I sent him out, but he did nothing. He sat on the bench, he didn't run with the torch, he didn't do anything for me, he got lazy, he got tired, he wouldn't preach the word, he was scared of man, he always trembled when someone came up in his face, he couldn't handle criticism. I don't want that, friend. What I want is on that final day, I want to stand before the Lord and I want to get on my knees and about that time I want there to be a holy hush in heaven and I want to hear angels going, oh, 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 and I want from the far right or the far left a crown to be passed from angel to angel. And I want it to be the most beautiful crown that's ever been manufactured on the streets of glory. I want it to have gold and emerald, precious stone, platinum and silver. I want everything God's ever got up in heaven and more. I want the most beautiful crown that's ever been created. And I want them to pass it along. And I want Paul to see it. I want Peter to see it. I want everyone to see it. I want Jesus to see it. And I want that crown as I'm on my knees. I want the Lord to take that crown and move it towards my head. And when he gets a little close, I want to grab it and I want to push it towards him. And he's going to push it towards me. And I'm going to push it towards him. And he's going to push it towards me. And I'm going to push it towards him. And I'm going to go, no, you don't, Lord Jesus. This is for you. This is all I can do. This is all I can do. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb! Worthy is the Lamb! Worthy is the Lamb! Worthy is the Lamb! Holy! 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 I want to make sure, friends, on that day that I have something worthwhile to throw at his feet. And all it represents, the crown represents our work on earth. That's it, what we did with our lives, friend. And I want something. So make sure, friend, on that day, that ain't what you throw at his feet, friend. That's garbage. That's garbage. That is garbage. Quit whining. Quit belly aching. We're soldiers. We're soldiers in the greatest army. Make sure on that final day, the commander-in-chief says, you fought the bloodiest war that had ever taken place on the face of the earth, but victory is yours. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's stand together. Sure, somebody's got to have an announcement right now. Anybody got an announcement? <laughs> Kara Robinson, you got an announcement? 
Cheryl's coming with announcements. How many appreciate this lady right here? She does, did all this. Eh? No. Who's with you? Anybody with you? Did it? Laura Hill. Laura Hill, where are you at? Come on up here, Laura. We're going to do this at the beginning, probably at the end, too. A lot of you didn't clap because you don't know who she is. These folks right here are the ones that put this conference together. So if you got a gripe, <laughs> don't talk to them because they have worked like soldiers, friend. And it, the, the hardest thing with this conference was turning people away. It was hard. This thing closed out after about two or three weeks. As we opened it up, it sold out immediately. And I got pastors were crying from other countries literally over the telephone. They had made plans to come to it, but they had no idea it was just going to be like that. It would be over, and there would be absolutely no room. And so that, that's some of the stuff they've had to think of what it would be like when a pastor's coming, and he says, can I just bring, you know, my best friend from town? And they had to go, no, it's hard, friend. But these folks have done a fantastic job, and rather, rather than if you've got any complaints, just keep it to yourself. But when you see these guys, just tell them, good job. Amen. God bless you. One thing we want to say, too, is we're, we're very, very sorry that everybody's not able to get in this building. Um, even though we uh, registered a certain amount of people, it still went into overflow. We wasn't aware it was going to do that. And so please accept our deepest apologies, those of you that can't be in the building each night. But uh, please understand also that uh, with so many people being here, there's going to be a few kinks that we've got to get worked out. And so we're going to accommodate everybody just as quickly and efficiently as we can. But I think so far everything has gone real well. And uh, please uh, work with us, and we know that you will. Yesterday, of all days, you know, anytime we have a minister's conference, we love ministers so deeply. And anytime we have a minister's conference, it seems like anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And yesterday, after 4 o'clock, right before you were gathering and right as you were gathering, we had electrical problems. We had plumbing problems. Our commodes were all stopped up. We had all kinds of problems. And so when we came up here last on the platform, all of us were just in a tizzy and a ball of nerves, you know, because so much had gone wrong. If it could go wrong, it would at a time like this. But we are so thrilled and we feel so honored to have all of you here, all you pastors, evangelists, wives, staff members. We feel so honored and we feel so humbled that uh, we have the opportunity to talk into your life. We certainly don't know a lot. We don't know a lot of things to say. Like Steve said, we've stumbled up on most of it. But thank you for hearing us. And the speakers in the afternoon session and the night sessions are absolutely tremendous. Anybody that we have manning any pulpit in any of these sessions are wonderful speakers. Anyone you choose to go to, you'll leave out saying, my God, what a blessing. So it's good to have you. And we pray that when you leave here, after your tenure is up this week, after this conference is over, our prayer is that after you leave, you'll leave saying, God, thank you for touching my life. Just to make sure that lunch rotation works well, I just want to explain it to you one more time. On your badge, at the bottom of your conference delegate badge, there should be, a, in the, the corner of it, it says Group A or Group B. That's going to determine your lunch schedule for you today. So everybody check that badge now so you'll know where to go. Group A will go to lunch. The bulk of you will go out to the tent out front. It's waiting, waiting for you. You're ready to be served. There will be 300 seats back here in the, in the cafeteria also. So most of you need to head that way. Probably this crowd right up front can head down the hallway to the cafeteria. Group A goes to lunch. Group B goes into session. Brother Dick Rubin will be here in the sanctuary, and Brother Richard Crisco, our youth pastor, will be across the street in the chapel. God bless you. At the end of that lunch, Group B will go to lunch, and Group A will go into session. The youth, stand still. <laughs>